Well, because of the engine was sobbing, and you know, and he kept running it that way. And I told him, I All right, good camera working, we're good. We have to stream to Facebook instead of YouTube, so we'll see when it fits out the oil. And then it fits out the oil, and then the car takes off. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? All right, we're continuing our look here in, in John. We've gone to John 2, John 3, John 4. Now we're into John 5, the Bible truth today. God heals us. And the learner goal, I can identify how the healing of the man at the pool reveals Jesus' ultimate healing mission for the world. That's really the focus that we'll be trying to come out of here. Jesus Christ heals you. So the opening reflection, in what ways can sudden or persistent illness lead to either increased faith or abandonment of faith? And why the difference? What do you think? So in what ways can sudden or persistent illness lead to either increased faith or abandonment of faith? Lori? Well, they can abandon them because they blame him for their illness or fears, but Hopefully they go to him and realize he's their strength and their healing help. And that's what he's trying to teach, right? So you got on the one hand, the, the, the person is put through that and they understand that this is to strengthen me. Sometimes though, knowing God's power that he could heal me, leads people to think, well then, forget him. He's not going to make this pain go away. Sometimes it's small things. Sometimes it's much bigger, longer, persistent things. What else? I just question God, where are you? You're not listening to me. <clears throat> Maybe he doesn't even exist or listen to me or care about me at all. To lead people that way. So that's the abandonment side. How does it increase Paul? Well, the difference between the two would be one is the response of faith that when you um, are facing some uh, trial in your life, that it drives you to the Word. You look to God's Word for comfort, the words and promises of God. You seek that and desire that. Whereas if a person is weak in faith or has no faith at all, it drives them away. Uh, if God's going to treat you this way, then they become bitter towards you. So there's a trust there, a loving trust, or an unloving doubt, really, is what it comes down to. So, yeah, it really comes down to that difference there. Um, that is our generation. So God, first of all, tells us it's going to happen. And whose fault is it? Our own, right? God of Eden, who brought the, the curses upon them, God did, but it was really a result of their own actions that they were going to have these, these issues. I think that's one thing that we see in the world, too, is God gets blamed a lot of times for us. And at the heart of that is this idea that I deserve something from God. That's always the hardest part. Like, I deserve to be treated better than I am. Therefore, God should treat me that way. When really, what we don't realize is that we don't even deserve a breath in our lungs, much less anything else we get from God. So God's loving presence here in this life, He bestows. So understanding then, if He really does care about me and is that gracious, even though I don't deserve it, well then these hard times, He must be teaching me something. So, uh, we'll see here a man who's going through 
quite a hard time. Uh, 38 years, we're going to find out. Where they are is, hey, we're not in the temple today. We've been looking at the temple a lot, uh, but we're right next to it. Let me show you kind of where they are in Jerusalem. Jesus, for another festival, we don't, we're not told exactly which one, but he's going to return to Jerusalem. And this is where uh, we find out that he, let's see, where is the Jerusalem? There's one. Just looking at the map. Here you see Jerusalem, roughly Jesus' day. You got the temple complex, huge part of Jerusalem, the city. You got uh, the Antonia Fortress, as you can see. Let's see, I'm trying to find. Maybe it's not listed here. Oh, here it is. It's missing a Herod's palace here with the different towers there around his palace. Um, the Bethesda pool is going to be up here. You can see it's uh, got different names there. And it depends on which manuscript. Different manuscripts can have different names for it. Bethesda, Bethsaida, Beth, Zatha. They mean different things. Uh, Bethsaida, I believe, is House of Mercy. Uh, Beth, or maybe that's Beth Zatha. Beth Sayada. Sorry, I wrote it down here. Uh, Beth, Bethesda, House of Mer Mercy. Beth Zatha, House of the Olive Tree, maybe? So, trying to figure out, some people are trying to figure out the, the etymology of what's, what's happening there. It was given different names. You see that with a few different places in the Bible. Um, so, there's Jerusalem in general. What I want to show you now is video. Where is it? It's kind of a, a flyover of what Jerusalem would have looked like back in the first century. So I'll let this go through and I'll show you eventually where Bethesda is. So this is looking north, basically. You see the temple complex. And understand walking by that how the disciples would go, wow, look at this magnificent structure. Now we're going to go over to the west side of the city. You can see Hezekiah's pool on that side of the city. Yeah, different pools in different parts of the city. There's Herod's palace with the different towers. Now we're going to move really towards the north part of the city. And here is the Bethesda pool. That's what it would have looked like. We'll take a look at another picture in a second here. There on the north side, right, you can see right next to the temple complex. And there this video ends with the temple, as we can see, facing east. So you see the different gates. Kind of fascinating to see it all kind of come together to zoom out there just to kind of show you the, the view. To see the different hills you can hear Kidron Valley, Hinnom Valley, Mount of Olives uh, down there, number three. You can see where all this is connected. He's here all, these, all the time. And it'll end with a view of the temple itself. Now what we're looking here today, like I said, Bethesda. <coughs> which is right off of here. You can see we're going to here have five colonnades, and you can understand why, right? All these different colonnades here, where the different sick people would sit waiting to get into the pool. Uh, there's two different pools, upper and lower pool. And here's a little bit of a different picture of a rendering of what it would have looked like. It's been excavated, it doesn't look as pretty these days, of course, but there's our setting for today. Let's take a look then at John 5. Let's take a look at what it, we find out happens there. But somebody have to read the first five verses. Give us some good context. Bruce, go ahead. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool of Hermione in Athletic.
One man who has served who has been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him standing there and knew he had not been even sick for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? All right, we'll pause there. It has a question there. It says, Connect details from the description of the setting to other themes or events in the Old Testament. Um, I think whoever's writing this and, and kind of seeing their answer, they're kind of bordering on allegory here, almost, trying to find these different things of why John is writing these, trying to show, you know, shepherds gave Jesus was showing he was the shepherd of everyone in the pool, he's the water of life. And sometimes you get so bogged down into those those spiritual details, you kind of start to get to what's called allegory. You kind of miss the point of what's being said here. So um, we'll bypass the question uh, for this one, for this one. But I want, I want you to go to that point where it says the angel would stir up the water. Verse 4, for an angel would go down at certain times into the pool and stir up the water. Some early manuscripts do have this, but most uh, early and ancient and the best manuscripts do not include this. It seems that it was in addition that was given later on, perhaps to try to explain what would happen in verse seven. It says, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And so it connects this idea of an angel doing it and then healing. So was there this common idea of the first person that went in there would feel a little bit more energized by it or whatever it may be that kind of led to this idea, uh, this misconception. But just so you know, you can't rule out that an angel would go down there and stir it up at the same time. Um, this seems to have been an addition when you look at the manuscript that it's Paul. Yeah, it speaks of the movement of the water, and so maybe they had an attribute that's to some cause behind it, so then they talked about an angel doing it. Yeah, perhaps an angel did, right? And then they came up with this idea of, hey, if I go down there first, I can get healed by it. But what I want you to do uh, is describe this man's situation. Look at the details. How would you describe this man's situation? Dire. Why do you say dire? 38 years. I mean, that's a lot of people. Couldn't get down to the Yeah. It doesn't look like he has a whole lot of help. He said it doesn't look like he has a whole lot of help. So nobody's there to help me get down there. Help get to it. 38 years. Can you imagine having this issue? Nobody helped him down. When it gets stirred up, what happens? People will find out. Charging ahead of them. What else about this man's situation? Helpless, alone. He was homeless. Homeless, it seems. This is where he spends his time. Right there in the colonies, yeah, Paul. You wonder if he hadn't given some thought to staying in the water, but then you end up being a fish ray, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be healed, so hopefully not. I would say he was very homeless. I mean, like we had very. Yeah, you think after that time, it's got to be questioning, why do I keep doing this? But he really has nothing else, it seems. And so he's still there, and he wants to do that first one. He thinks that this, this pool is going to heal him. What examples of physical ailments and situations are similar to people today? So how, how difficult the physical ailments can be, so many times you wonder, is it even worth it? That's a big thing these days, isn't it? Uh, that was a big thing, you know, during COVID that we heard come up a lot. The physical issues that people face, is it even worth living? Nowadays, we have people that do what? In Canada, sadly, has a program for this. Assisted suicide. So this idea of my physical situation is so bad, I might as well end it. So, you know, it saddens us to hear about that. What other uh, physical ailments and situations would be similar? Paul, I saw your hand. I think of the lady that uh, accompanies her choir. 
um, Vicki Berg, Brian Berg's sister, that she has a, a disability that makes life very difficult for her. There could be disabilities, perhaps, that make it real hard. That'd be crazy that Vicki isn't in the same dire situation. He's been strengthening her faith. Um, but yeah, so people can get to different situations where it's, it's hard to move around. Um, we have physical situations that are still the same, even with modern medicine as it was to this day. Let me ask you this, what examples of mental ailments and situations are similar today? Depression. Do you know that teenage depression, especially among girls, all time high? Since it's been recorded. What contributes to that mental health issues? Social media. Social media. Peer pressure along with that. You know of anybody having mental health difficulties? Maybe it's you. Here, let's continue to learn about what Jesus has here. But one more question for you. What examples of spiritual ailments and situations are similar today? Where was this man spiritual? Seems to be an unbeliever. He was putting his trust in the water only. In this healing, I got to quick go down there in some sort of process, you know. He was really putting his trust in that water. What else spiritually do you think? <laughs> Just think how down he had to be. We talked we talk about, you know, what does God, does he care about? Does he even know that I'm going through what I'm going through? 38 years. And you wonder, God hasn't done a thing for it. Spiritually, it must have been a real rough situation for this man. Yeah, he's going to meet Jesus here in a second. Let's read verses 6 through 9. Somebody like to read those? 6 through 9. Help, go ahead. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been sick a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the sick man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm going, someone else goes down to help me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He picked up his mat and walked. That day was the Sabbath. Dun dun dun! <laughs> what is the Sabbath? What does Jesus reveal about his power in this healing? Look for clues from the text. Instantly. 38 years compared to this contrast of instantly. That's not a mistake. No fool was needed. Just Jesus. Just Jesus and his word. That was it. Then eat some magic. Boom, there was his word. What else do you see about Jesus' power here? He can do it on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Huh. Who is Jesus? What authority does he have? He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of the commandment there. He can do what he wants. He sympathizes with our suffering. We see power and sympathy. Good point there. So he, the love that he has to help this man. Nobody has shown him love. He's been all alone. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? It's almost like, whoa, what a cruel question. You don't think I want to get well? But it was a lead-in, wasn't it, to, well, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to make you well. So here we see Jesus' love yet again. Individual love, too. This man that seemed to be a, have been forgotten. Then the interesting thing happens here. Let's look at verses 10 through 17. Sad reaction here. So Sabbath day, and then we hear verse 10. Somebody like to read these? Go ahead, Maria. So the Jesus told the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. You are not permitted to carry the mat. He answered him, The one who made me well told me, Take up your mat and walk. And then they asked him, Who is the man who the told you? Take up your mat. Get up and walk. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Look, you are well now. 
do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went back and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. So the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working right up to the present time, and I am working too. Here we see a, a really major time when Jesus went up against the Jewish leaders for the beginning here of the ministry. The question there is what details from this section further reveal Jesus' purpose for coming to the world? And how does this relate to how he heals us? How God heals us? After he healed a man, he wasn't going to just hide away and not let him who he, let him know who he was. You know, he wanted to let him know even though Jesus knew very well that he was going to be facing seven great things in the Jewish leaders. Because that was what it was all about, right? Not to heal the man physically. Yep. The man was going to die eventually. And after that death, then what would, what's the matter? What's the true important thing? That's who he is, so reveal who he was. It wasn't going to leave him hanging. What else, Paul? Jesus again reveals here that he has the authority to forgive sins by healing this man. He is God. He is God. Yep, and they get that point. We'll talk about that in a second, too. What are the details in the section? Reveal his purpose for coming to the world. Well, when he told him to go and sin no more, he said, Oh, worse things could happen to you, which is why he's here. Why What's the worst thing he's talking about? Hell. Imagine how terrible. What kind of a living hell physically mm -hmm. would 38 years of this man's situation have been? And Jesus says, Worse can happen to you? Yeah, he's obviously making there a spiritual point. So what's he saying there? He wants the man to think about what? Not his present physical welfare, but his spiritual eternal welfare. The huge future that's in front of him. So Jesus are really there getting his getting the man to think. Now contrast the Jews versus Jesus here. You think they maybe saw this guy after 38 years? Maybe Rath, oh, here's that one guy. And yet it wasn't, hey, 38 years, and he's going, wait, what? You're healed? It was, why are you carrying your mat? Can you imagine? Compare that with Jesus. What was Jesus' main focus? The commandment? You said? Love for the individual. Love for the man, which is why God gave the commandments in the first place, which is what the Sabbath was all about. They added all these regulations onto the Sabbath and emptied of his love. Jesus gets to the very point of the Sabbath. Now, in what ways can we take this to heart for ourselves? Verse 14. Look, you are well now. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. In what ways can we take that to heart for ourselves? Don't be ready for the future of heaven. This earthly thing, it, it's going to end. How much time do you put into your your physical health now? I mean, first of all, you got three meals a day, right? Maybe if you work out, it's another thing. Shower, brush your teeth. Yeah, just the, the physical, just the day, daily well-being. Comb your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Spend a few hours combing our hair. <laughs> those snags. Yeah. Go on to the doctor, doctor's appointments, and how are you regular with those doctor's appointments? Right? You get the little mind chart email. Oh, I guess, you know, I better. No, it's uh, how regimented we are when it comes to our physical health. What about spiritual, eternal health? We have the same attitude. Do we give ourselves that same daily three times a day meal in here, right? Just something to think about. 
do not, uh, what does he say? Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. All right, what did Jesus mean in verse 17? So they attacked Jesus, became, uh, began to persecute him because he's doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, my father is working right up to the present time and I'm working too. What was his point? He wants all of them to be saved. Who does? Not just Jesus, but the Father. And the Father's working. Was it a Sabbath day? Does God take a day off? Can you imagine if God took a day off? It would be a trouble. But when Jesus said, my Father is working, I'm working too. What's he saying? I and the Father are one. Did they get his point? Sure. Look at verse 18. This is why the Jews tried to kill him all the more. Because he was not merely breaking the Sabbath, but even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Oh, they knew, but they, got, they took the point. Jesus' point, I am the Lord, I am God, I am here. I'm working, the Father's working, we're not taking days off. We're going to help people and love them and, and care for them. So think about what that tells you. When you have physical, mental, emotional, spiritual ailments, difficulties, how does this give you comfort? He's always there. He's always there. What else? He's working every day of the week, and for whom? For us. Corey? At any time, you don't have to, oh, well, sorry, it's got to stay off, we're not going to bother. <coughs> what else? Where do we get that help from him? Word. The word. It's like we're doing now. Go to the word for that. I don't know, I've got something I'm struggling with. Let me hear his own words. Final reflection there. Identify how the healing of the man at the pool reflects Jesus' spiritual healing for the whole world. Wants everyone. Not just the super noticeable, pop, popular, happy, well people, but those the lowlies, those who nobody cares about. The man didn't go to Jesus and ask to be healed. Jesus just healed him. Went to him. Yeah. yeah. He comes to us too the same way. We don't come and ask him. Well said. What else? Jesus said that I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And here how well this incident bears that out. Jesus' reason for coming was so that we might have life, spiritual life, not necessarily the healing of our physical bodies, but the healing of our souls. And then know what it really is to live life to its fullest, to live for Christ. And it's going to be neat to see where this goes then, because it's exactly the point really of the Gospel of John, where he'll go eventually here at chapter 5, got the feeding of the 5,000, then he gets into the bread of life discourse, where he's saying, you just care about bread. I'm the bread of life. You really should care about me, and so on. Continues to guide here the Gospel of John, so we'll see that as we go on. One other, one other thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, here again, we see that oftentimes in the Gospel of John, Jesus deals with people one on one. And we want to remember that with ourselves, too. That He's the personal Savior, that He treats us as though we're the only people on earth that He has to help and, and comfort. What personal, devoted, committed love. Right, we'll take a look at again here, service number two. Yeah. One other thing in the whole last chapter five, the last basically the last verses. If you did not believe Moses, you will not believe in me also. And it brings to, to light the fact that even after Adam got Jesus was there in the garden, Adam and Eve sinned. Jesus walked over and says, Where are you? We were naked and didn't want to see you anymore. You know, Jesus is that loving, caring God that even in Moses, all of Moses is right. Where are you, right? Like you said, come back or yep. Another thing, too, uh, if you've ever seen the, the show The Chosen, you know, there are some things, and they admit this, too, that they, they take that aren't in the scripture. They kind of add for that, the TV show admits of it. 
Uh, but it does have an episode on this account. Uh, an interesting one, kind of helps you see it from the guy's eyes. Let's say a prayer. I'll wait for the roller here to get there. You go, but we pray. Lord Jesus, we know that you see us. We know that you love us because you went to the cross and paid for our sins. Lord, forgive us for the times when we doubt your love, when we focus on this earthly life and our well-being here instead of you. Help us focus eternally, Lord, and especially as it goes through you and you alone. We praise and thank you that you have paid for our sins, that we can have an eternal life to look forward to. We ask that you continue to bless us in it. In your name, amen. Have a good week.